Hey everyone, so we're here to um, talk about our first animal phylum, which is the phylum Periphera, uh, here in Zoology Lab, so let's get to it. So, um, just want to give you a basic intro into what we're going to be doing this semester, talk a little bit about the sponges, and some miscellaneous information about the sponges. So now we are talking animals. You remember last week we talked about protozoans, and they were single-celled and they were eukaryotic and they had mobility and sometimes they ingested their food but they're not considered animals they don't have a close common ancestor with the rest of the animals <clears throat> but uh now we're going to finally start talking about things that are in the kingdom animalia and so think about your taxa what's the next taxon below a kingdom it's the phylum and so that's how we're going to organize the labs we organize them by the phyla so phylum is singular, phyla is plural. Um, all animals are multicellular. So last week we had unicellular organisms, now we're talking multicellular organisms. Um, and remember, you know, last week's protozoans weren't considered animals. Um, so let's talk about our first phylum, which is the periphera, or the sponges. Okay, and these are um, probably some of the first animals were sponges. Now, these are filter feeders, and they have pores called ostia, and they suck water in through those pores, and that's where you get the, the term porifera. Um, and again, the common ancestor with other animals goes way back. These were um, probably some of the early organisms that we can consider animals were sponges. So here's a figure from your book, just giving you a general idea. Um, so when I say sponge, um, obviously, you probably think of, you know, the first thought is the thing that you use to clean things with, but, but you don't realize that these are actually living animals, and they have very different shapes. Um, and we talk a lot about how the sponges are different from other animals, and one of the differences is they don't really have any body symmetry. So we talked about radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. The sponges don't really have any of that. There's no real symmetry here. And if we look at our phylogeny, you can see um, where these are classified and, and um, how they relate to the other phyla. Remember that uh, we said these are multicellular organisms, but they don't form tissues. And so that was one of the things that separates the sponges from all the other animals is they don't form those germ layers during development. Um, and then consequently, they don't form any sort of tissues. What they have is this, um, you know, organization of cells that are held in this non-cellular matrix called, called mesohill. And so you can see why we think that these are um, older organisms. is because they don't have tissues. They don't have cells that are organized into a, a particular type of tissue but their cells are not independent of one another. They all work together. So it is a single organism. And they don't really have a skeleton or anything. They have this matrix called mesohill. Um, and you'll remember that um, when we talked about the protozoans, we had like the volbox, like those colonial protozoans that were all individual organisms, but they lived together and they sort of coordinated. This is like that, but the next step up. These are not individual, the cells aren't individual organisms. The cells cannot exist on their own, um, but they um, don't quite form tissues and they don't form, quite form tight junctions like cells do in other animals. Um, and the cells can kind of communicate a little bit. So this is sort of like the next step up in organization. Um, now that mesohill um, is made of something called uh, spongin or collagen, um, and then that is supported by these things called spicules, these mineralized pieces called spicules. And so what kind of molecule is, is collagen? You remember we talked that collagen is a protein, and spongin is a similar protein that's only found in the periphera. And so you've got this um, tough protein, and then you've got these spicules embedded in it. And so these spicules are um, not organic. They're little mineralized pieces. And so you can kind of see some examples of spicules here and kind of the, the fiber that's formed by the spongin. 
And so think of the texture of a sponge. You know, it's tough, but it's flexible. And so they don't really have an internal skeleton. They just have this, this matrix of protein with these tough pieces embedded in it. You know, think about your skin. Your skin's got a lot of collagen in it, and it's sort of tough and flexible. So it's kind of a similar idea. Um, and again, none of these are cells, right? So these are just things that are created, you know, that are made by the sponge cells. These are uh, the things that form the mesohill, that form this matrix, and then the sponge's cells are embedded in this. So this is kind of a structural thing. Now the spicules are made of silica or glass, sand, or they're made of calcium. And again, these are inorganic and they're mineralized and so they're tough. Um, the spicules are important because these are the way that we identify different um, sponges as we look at the spicules. Um, here's another picture showing um, kind of a sponge and you zoom in and you kind of see this matrix of spicules and things to kind of form the structure of the sponge. And then, uh, um, you know, the pores are embedded in this that allows the water in. Now, they don't have any kind of symmetry. They don't really have a gut or a mouth or a digestive tract because they don't have tissues, right? So they're very different from most other animals. Um, and they also have this... Um, unique way of feeding called filter feeding and you'll see this in some animals but not not designed the way it is in sponges basically filter feeding is is you suck water in through those pores and then you've got kind of a filter and as the water goes through this filter the small particles that are in the water are retained and then the water is expelled out but those food particles are then absorbed into the cells and sponges are are notorious for being able to filter tremendous amounts of water per day, 1,500 liters per day in some of these big sponges. And so here's, a, again, just kind of a generalized sponge. And the ostia, the pores, are on the sides here. And the water gets sucked in and then expelled out through the top, and that's called an osculum. And so that's sort of how these things um, survive. They can't really move very much, and so they just sit there and they filter things out of the water. Okay, so how do they um, get the water to flow through these pores? And how are they able to filter feed? They don't rely on just the existing currents, they make their own current. And they have specialized cells called choanocytes. And these uh, choanocytes are also called collar cells. These have a flagellum that beats, and as it beats, it pulls water through. And as it pulls water through, it also has a little filter. And so all the small particles that are in the water get caught in that filter. And so here's a figure from your book showing these. And um, you can see that it shows the, the direction of water flow and the direction of food flow. And so that little beating flagellum moves the water and the water goes through this little filter there. And then the food gets pulled down and then, in, you know, encased in a vacuole and taken into the cell where it can be broken down. So you've got a whole bunch of these things along the sides of the sponge all beating at the same time. You can get a lot of water moving through this sponge. Um, now, what's interesting is these cells closely resemble a different group of organisms that are protozoans called coanoflagellates. All right. And so there's a group of protozoans that look a lot like these cells, right? And so these coanoflagellates, you see that they are considered an outgroup here in your phylogeny from your book. These are unicellular eukaryotes. And so they would be like the ones we looked at last week. And you remember some of those prokaryotes, or excuse me, some of those protozoans from last week had a flagellum that they used to move around. Well, these organisms, these uh, uh, coanoflagellates, have that flagellum and a filter that they use. And it's just like the cells in those sponges. And so you can imagine, you know, if you've got a colony of these unicellular organisms, which we saw other unicellular organisms that live in a colony, if you have a colony of these things, over time they might evolve into a multicellular organism, which would be sort of the first sponge. And we see very similar cells like this in those sponges. And so 
it's kind of um, kind of helps to paint the picture of how these organisms evolved. All right, then just a little um, miscellaneous information, interesting things about the sponges. Uh, of course, sponges are sessile, which means they don't move, they stay in one place, but the larvae are free swimming. So this is how the sponges can spread around. They have both asexual and sexual reproduction. We'll see this in a lot of uh, the animals that we talk about. Um, sexual reproduction, um, the sponges are mostly hermaphroditic, so you don't have male spon sponges and female sponges. All sponges have both gametes. And um, when they're ready to reproduce, they'll release a cloud of sperm, which will go settle on and get sucked up by other sponges. So, so you can uh, fuse that sperm with the eggs and you can produce larvae that way. Um, but also the sponges can bud off and just a piece of sponge can bud off and drift. And whenever it settles down, it'll form an adult. Um, sponges are also able to um, repair their own damage. So if you tear a piece of a sponge off, it'll grow back. Um, they also produce these things called gemules, which are kind of like little cysts almost that can survive a harsh environment. So here's a freshwater sponge producing these gemules. And these are tough and they're um, aggregations of, of a few cells that can wait until the conditions are better and then they can basically form a new sponge in that way too. So that's another form of asexual reproduction in the sponges. Um, of course, if you're scuba diving or snorkeling in the ocean, you can see a lot of these sponges here. There's a great picture of them. They have these gorgeous colors. Usually the colors are due to symbionts. And so you've got um, other protozoans, uh, algae, dinoflagellates and things that live with within the sponges and in a symbiotic relationship. What's interesting is a lot of these um, symbionts have antimicrobial activity or antiviral activity, activity, any cancer activity, and so these are things that um, are being investigated. And may, perhaps we can use these symbionts um, for our advantage. Um, so, do we have sponges in Kentucky? Yes, we do. I mentioned a freshwater sponge earlier. Uh, freshwater sponges are rare; they're much more common in the uh, in the ocean. But there are freshwater sponges, and you can find them um, in pristine environments here in Kentucky. And this is what one would look like. Um, so cool. We have them here in Kentucky, which I bet you didn't know. And so that's it for the periphera. Um, we're going to look at some of these structures, and we're going to look at some of these adults in class. And so let me know if you've got any questions. See ya.